I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles. We're going to mix things up a little bit. We're going to have a time of prayer uh, after uh, the message this morning. So I thought I would go ahead and preach first. I know I have in the bulletin, if you look there, I have Isaiah 6. I want to give just a little bit of a backdrop uh, to Isaiah 6 as we continue on. Uh, really with our series that talks about evangelism and what that looks like in the world that is around us and the culture that we find ourselves in. Because really things have not changed much since Isaiah's time. You know what? Uh, the calendar has changed a little bit. But can I say that the hearts of people certainly have not. Okay, so to those people that would say the Old Testament is not relevant for today, uh, I would I would wholeheartedly disagree with that uh, because God does speak uh, through His Word, and there's a reason why we have this. And so, as we look at Isaiah chapter six, I want us to look at Isaiah chapter five, and just for a moment, and I want to give just a a brief overview or summary of Isaiah chapter five because it is really going to set the tone for Isaiah chapter six. And as, as we look at this, I want us to understand uh, that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Okay? Uh, like I said before, the date on the calendar has changed, but the hearts of men have not. Isaiah chapter 5 uh, starts about talking about the vineyard. The vineyard. And so, in uh, verses uh, chapter 1 through uh, verse 7, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, it talks about the vineyard, and it's talking about how God has given Israel everything that they need to live a life that pleases God. He has provided for them. He has taken care of them. Right? He's given them everything that they need. But yet, in that provision, they did not follow God. They didn't do it. So that would be like, okay, we got Harley and Charity up there. I'm not picking on y'all, okay? But that would be like, as a parent, you have given your children everything that they need. Some parents give them everything that they want. Is there a difference? Susie didn't say yes. She said, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a big difference. <clears throat> God has given them everything they need to live a life pleasing to Him, satisfying to themselves, but yet they completely walked away from that and destroyed it. It reminds me of those families who uh, despoil their kids absolutely rotten and nothing is enough. Okay? For those teenagers, for example, that have have the latest iPhone, what, what number are we up to now? About 3,000? I, I don't know. Uh, but the next model comes out, what must they have? The next one. Have you ever asked what's wrong with the old one? Do you know what's wrong with the old one? It's not the new one! And they always have to have something better. It's never enough. Here you have an example of that. God has given them everything they need. Uh, as it's discussed here in verses 1 through 7. And so this vineyard is destroyed and is, is taken away from them. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The men of Judah are his pleasant planting, and he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. We see this in verse 7. So it's better than having everything. They end up with nothing. Uh, starting in verse 8, really, uh, uh, the author here is, is giving one of the woes. And is saying that judgment is going to come to the nation. So the question becomes, what does the judgment of God look like? And Clay, I wanted to add this in here so bad. We would have been here till three o'clock this afternoon. So we'll do a stand a, a standalone message a little bit later on. But 
But what does the judgment of God look like? Some would say it's earthquakes, right? Uh, has anybody ever been in an earthquake? Okay, I've been in one. Yeah, uh, Timmy did shimmy that day, but that's about the only time I've done that. Okay. Storms, war, and rumor of war. All of these things have been pronounced by people as judgment of God. The ultimate judgment of God is what we really find in Romans chapter 1, where God gave them up and gave them over to a depraved mind. Right? And, and so, what is the judgment of God on a sinful nation? Uh, it's the withdrawal of his presence. So some people would say the judgment is coming. I would say judgment is here. And in the book of Isaiah, we're kind of seeing this. Okay? And so when you understand uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 5, and you look at what God has done, and you look at what the people have rejected, you look at the fact that they are now under judgment, it kind of gives a backdrop to Isaiah chapter 6 as we talk about the call to serve. The call to serve. And so when we look at that, we see in Isaiah chapter 6 that it's very often been called uh, the solemn call to serve the Lord. And so uh, because of his special ministry, the prophet receives this revelation from God and he is given a rather difficult uh, uh, message that he will be telling the people. And it's this, uh, you have been disobedient. Who wants to be the messenger of that message, right? But because of disobedience, this is what is going to happen. So in spite of the message, Isaiah says, um, I will do this. He volunteers uh, to do that. And he hears from God in a powerful way. So God prepared Isaiah so that he would hear the call, so that he would respond to the call. Respond to the purpose that God had for him. And so when we look in Isaiah now, uh, the bulletin says Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. I think we'll probably get through the first four verses. Because instead of being here till 3, we could be here till 1 if we went through the whole thing. Okay, uh, But we're going to try and get through the first four verses here uh, this morning. Uh, verses 1 through 4 talks about the being called. Isaiah's call. And it gives a rather historical perspective where we find ourselves here. Uh, in verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, it says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. He was high, lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So the year of King Uzziah's death was approximately 740 B.C. Uh, his reign was very important in Jewish history. Uh, Uzziah had bought brought many benefits to the country. He had introduced really an era of prosperity and peace. <clears throat> and he reigned for quite a long time, actually. He reigned for 52 years. That's a long time. Many of the people in Jerusalem had lived their entire lives under his reign. The national boundaries had been extended. Commerce, the economy, the infrastructure had all been extended and had flourished. And probably most importantly, during this time, uh, they enjoyed a time of peace. Okay? When you look through the Old Testament, you know what? Not every place and every time was peaceful. Here we have 52 years of relative peace. But then we see that something happens where Uzziah began his reign in godliness. We see this in 2 Kings chapter 15, by the way, where it says, uh, He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He had sought God, and God blessed him. Uzziah was victorious in battle. Like I said, uh, 
uh, infrastructure improvements. Uh, there was agricultural improvement. There was peace and prosperity in the, line, in the land. Uzziah had restored the military power. So for most of his career, Uzziah was a great and beloved king. Who doesn't enjoy times of prosperity? Who doesn't enjoy times of peace? <clears throat> but then we see that the life of Uzziah ends on a very sad note. The last years of his life really took on the form of a Shakespearean tragedy, if you can call it that. His career was marred by the sin of pride, which came after he had acquired all of these things. All of the wealth, all of the power. He had defied the word of God by boldly entering the temple and claiming for himself the rights that God had only given to the Levitical priests. In other words, here is King Uzziah deciding being the king wasn't enough. But he was going to go in to the temple where he should not have been. The priests, rightly so, call him out on this, trying to stop his sacrilege, and Uzziah becomes enraged. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 21, it says that he screamed, leprosy broke out on his forehead. He lived in a separate house, being a leper, cut off from the house of the Lord. And so because of the sin of pride, the sin of arrogance, looking at everything that he had done and saying, I did this, Uzziah dies. And despite the shame of his later years, the sin that took him to what his ending was to be. It was still a time of national mourning. It was a time that threw the nation in upheaval. Whenever a king died, there becomes a power vacuum. What happens in a power vacuum? People vying for the same position. You see this and that and everything else. Other countries are noticing this. What happens whenever a country gets a new leader? Very often that country is tested in a lot of different ways. So there was a lot of uncertainty. Not just in the government. But everyday people like you and I, some of them, it's the only leader they had known. And so during this time of transition, Isaiah goes to the temple to worship and to pray. And here God gives him this vision that starts out in verse 1. In the, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Sitting upon a throne, high lifted up, his train, the train of his robe filled the temple. In a time of national crisis, God did not leave. This crisis had many different faces to it, didn't it? But yet here is God communicating with Isaiah, the king is dead, or, or he is dying at this point. It says in the year that he died, I saw the Lord. Isaiah raised his head during worship. He sees another king. He doesn't see King Uzziah. He doesn't see an imperfect king. But rather he sees the ultimate king. He sees the one who is sovereign, the one who is sitting on the throne of David. And it gives a time frame there, doesn't it? 
forever. He sees the ultimate king. And he's seated on the throne. I gotta be honest with y'all. When I'm worried about something, or when I maybe get a little bit upset about something, I walk. I'm a pacer. I just can't. Always has been. Not sure how many times as a kid my dad had to replace the carpet in the house. That's just me. <clears throat> so here's everything that's going on. And everybody is wondering and is fearful, is mourning. And yet here is God, the ultimate king. What's he doing? Is he up pacing? Does God ever climb the walls? The short answer is no. What's he doing? He's sitting down. And he's not sitting just anywhere, but rather he is sitting on the throne. He is in the proper position for kingship. He is high and he is lifted up. And this is where Isaiah sees him. Notice the word begins with the capital letter and is finished with lower case. He has seen the Lord high and lifted up. Wonder who did Isaiah see? Have you ever asked that question? Who was the Lord that was mentioned here? Well, I think we can go to John chapter 12, verse 41. John 12 gives us the answer here. John 12, 41 says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Who is the him, the pre-incarnate Christ? So he is seeing it, Jesus in all of his glory that is mentioned there. And so Isaiah was given access to the throne room of heaven. He enters it into the presence of the Holy One of Israel. How would you like to be the audience in that room? Why is this important? Well, it's important because you might recall that men are not allowed to see the face of the Almighty God, and I believe on your insert, I put some references down there that, uh, that you can look at. The scriptures warn us that no man can see God and live. Okay. There's some other references there, Exodus 33. Uh, verses 19 through 23, uh, Genesis 23, Judges 6. Uh, there's a lot of references that talk about these things. And just as an aside, if somebody says that they have been to heaven and they have seen the face of God, uh, I can assure you if they had, they would be dead. No man can look on the face of God and live. Isaiah comes to the temple. There was a crisis of sovereignty in the land. The long reigning monarch Uzziah was either dead or soon to be dead at this point. Isaiah's eyes are open, and instead of seeing a feeble, fallible king, he sees the real king of the nations, and he sees God in all of his power, in all of his authority and dominion seated on the throne. And this throne was high. It's greater and exceeded all other thrones because of the position of the one who sits on it. He is the ultimate king. The robes of the sovereign king were long and loose flowing. It says they filled the palace. I'm not sure there's even words to describe what that would look like. Have you ever tried to envision what you're reading? I can't even envision that. A sign of power, a sign of authority, a sign of royalty. 
Isaiah chapter 6 verse 2 goes on to describe a little bit more about this. Above him stood the seraphim. He had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. You see, it's customary for a monarch to be accompanied by his court. There would be people there or, or uh, angels there in this case to attend. And so here they are, the seraphim are personal spiritual beings. We see that they have faces, they have feet, they have hands, they have speech. They are seen as standing up, waiting on the position of the one that is on the throne. Each seraph has six wings. Why do they have six wings? Well, because God is sovereign and we are not. And when you stop to think about the seraphim, these created beings, they had to shield their eyes from the direct gaze on the face of God. So they covered their face. The sight of God brought humility within them. Second pair of wings covered their feet. The third pair of wings flew the seraphim around the throne. And what were they doing? One called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. What was the work of the seraphim? Simple. They were praising God. They were in an act of praise. One group cries out, another group would answer. Isaiah stares in silence as this goes on, as they are declaring the holiness of God. The message of the seraphim really reveals a wonderful message about God and who God is. And you've heard me say this before, God is a holy God. And this is very true. Yet here in Isaiah 6, the seraphim, they add to that, don't, don't they? Holy, holy, holy. It's other three times. It's, it's said three times. And that's significant in the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language possesses an unusual way of describing things at times. Holy, holy, holy. Within the Hebrew language, that was the ultimate superlative that describes who God is and the character of God. So God's not just holy. He's not just holy, holy, but he is holy, holy, holy. Speaking of his majesty, and by the way, when you look at the attributes of God and you look at Scripture, nowhere in Scripture do you see where God is love, 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 do you? You don't find that. Nowhere in Scripture do you see it said that God is faithful, faithful, faithful. Nowhere in Scripture do you see where God is merciful, merciful, merciful. Why? The attributes of God start with recognizing the holiness of God. And can I say that God is a holy God whether you recognize it or not? That is where it begins. He is the thrice holy God. Holiness is central to who God is. Holiness is central to not just his character but to his essence as well. 
God is holy. And that means that he is separate from the unholy or the common. Holiness is distinctiveness. It is different from everything else. God's glory is not restricted to his essence, for the whole earth is full of his glory. The Hebrew word for glory, the Hebrew word is actually a word uh, called kavod, and it means something that's heavy, something that's weighty. And so when we talk about the glory of God, it's something that would drive us to our knees in worship and praise, recognizing that God is the holy God, and we certainly are not. Also in scripture, with that word of glory, essentially you're going to see it used in two different ways throughout scripture, okay? Uh, uh, the first one is called the intrinsic glory of God. That is who God is. That contains all of his attributes. That contains everything of who he is. God is holy. God is love. God is just. Uh, God is omnipresent. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. And the list goes on and on and on. Why is that important? Because with that use of glory, it brings us to the second, uh, the second way the word glory is used, and that is called ascribed glory. Ascribed glory. What that means is that we are giving God the glory that is due his name. So why is that important? Because the higher vision that we have of the intrinsic glory of God, we will be more apt to give God glory, to ascribe to him who he is, and recognizing that he is all of these things and that we are not. And so when we look at the glory of God and how that is defined in scripture, it is all of the divine perfection uh, that he has and that he exhibits as part of his essence and character. When we understand that, then when it comes to ascribing glory, that puts him in a whole different dimension and understanding. It refers to the reputation, the importance, the weight a person carries in society. We give God glory by enhancing his reputation, by acknowledging who he is. We're going to see a little bit later on that Isaiah does exactly this. Uh, he recognizes the glory of God and how different that is from where he is. Oh, then we would all do that. But that is the word glory. In verse 4, it gives us another description here. Some of the effects of the angel's worship. It says, the foundations of the thresholds shook, and the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. An effect of proper praise that was often was that the foundations shook. The very glory and strength of the song of praise caused the threshold to crumble. Talk about a worship service and a half. That's something else. The shaking suggests the awesome presence and power of God. In addition to that, we see that the temple was filled with smoke. In scripture, smoke often accompanies the presence of God, the Shekinah glory of God. You see that in Isaiah chapter 4, uh, verse 5. This is what worship looks like. And this is the glimpse that Isaiah had. what worship was supposed to look like. In times of a national mourning and tragedy, God has never lied.
those last years of Uzziah's life caused a lot of issues, not just for him, but for the country as well. And it can be very easy when we look around us and we see everything that is going on around us. It can be very easy for worship to be relegated way down here. You know, we, we come to church each Sabbath morning and we come here to worship, we come here to fellowship, nothing wrong with that. We come here to serve. We come here to voice what we believe and hopefully not just here but throughout the week we are living that out and we are voicing it as well. Uh, we come here to be the church. We leave here to be the church. And one of the roles of the church is going to be <coughs> worshiping the ultimate king. There are so many people today, and it doesn't matter what country uh, you are from, doesn't matter what style of government that may be, but there are so many people that will put their faith and their trust in the leader of that country for whatever reason. Sometimes it's out of admiration. Sometimes it's, uh, uh, can I say it's forced? Uh, sometimes there are governments that say, uh, uh, you will bow to me whenever I walk through, right? There are some repressive governments that will just do anything. There are some free governments that will allow anything. The role of the church is simply this, is to fulfill the purpose of the church. Isaiah got just a glimpse of this. And these first four verses are going to set the tone. We'll see this next week. These uh, uh, four verses really set the tone for Isaiah's confession for him seeing the ultimate king for who he is versus who he was. We're going to see that Isaiah had to come to an understanding that he was sinful, that he had unclean lips, but that there was a remedy for that. And that's important as we look at, uh, as we look at evangelism and what that is going to look like. Sharing our faith being willing uh, to go and to share and to know full well, I'm not perfect. Newsflash, as your pastor, I'm not perfect. All of you are going, amen. I was fully waiting for a loud one. Uh, I had a thought Scott would do that. Chris, thank you for holding him in chat. Um, you're not perfect either. But when we recognize the holiness of God, and the message that we have, the good news, the gospel. As we saw several weeks ago, the command is to share. And so we do that. Isaiah went through a time of preparation. We do too. Father, Father God, we thank you for your word. Father, as we as we think about that, Father, as we look at the role of the king, Father, we see in the world around us, we see examples of what that looks like. And, and Lord, uh, I pray that we would not look to the human pictures of kings and authorities as our final say. Father, we recognize that you are the ultimate king. Father, may we worship you as you deserve to be worshipped. May we have an understanding of who you are, Father, so that we can properly 